to our panel discussion, the EU and the Western Balkans. My name is Heinrich Kreft. I'm director of the Center for Diplomacy here at Andrashi University in Budapest. It's too bad that we cannot uh, join us here in presence uh, at the uh, shores of the Danube River, but I hope that this will be possible in, um, in uh, very soon at least. Well, let me start with some housekeeping. I will, after the housekeeping, introduce our panelists. Then we will see a video. Each panelist uh, will take the floor for about uh, five minutes. Um, that uh, then we have a second round so that every panelist will be able to um, to respond to the um, to the other panelists. At about seven p.m., I will uh, turn to to the audience. Um, um, and um, to your to your questions, we uh, have to end at uh, at uh, seven thirty because at least one of our panelists will have to leave us um, uh, sharply at uh, seven thirty. Well, I'm delighted to have such a distinguished panel here tonight. Um, I warmly welcome the Honourable uh, David McAllister, Member of the European Parliament, um, uh, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee who is joining us from Brussels uh, tonight. A warm welcome to you, Mr. McAllister. I also extend a warm welcome to um, Natasha Dragilovic. She is the coordinator of the National Convention on the European Union in Serbia, a former minister who is joining us from Belgrade. Also a warm welcome to you. Um, we are still missing Joachim Bitterlich. So I turn to um, Ambassador Johannes Sattler. Johannes Sattler is the head of the EU delegation in Bosnia and Herzegovina and EU special representative in Bosnia uh, and Herzegovina. And he joins us from Sarajevo tonight. Well, Olivier Baheli, the, um, the commissioner for neighborhood and enlargement is um, also missing. He had to drop out on, on short notice but he sent us a video statement. Uh, we will hear this video statement at the beginning of our discussion. Well, in, um, in the relations between the European Union and, um, and the Western Balkans, um, there's of course one overwhelming topic. This is enlargement, this is EU membership, this is EU accession. Um, a lot of talk uh, we have heard in the last couple of years about um, enlargement fatigue. I saw an article with the title on a slow train to nowhere, um, but there seems to be more recently a new momentum, a new momentum in the discussion of uh, enlargement. Nine EU member states have uh, called upon the EU's chief diplomat, uh, Joseph Borrell, to have a strategic discussion on the Western Balkans and um, on their prospects. The Portuguese uh, presidency has uh, put enlargement on, um, on the uh, General Affairs Council meeting uh, earlier uh, this, uh, this week. Um, today, uh, my foreign minister, uh, Heiko Maas, um, is in Belgrade. Yesterday, he was in, in, in Kosovo. So there seems to be a, a new momentum uh, building, and uh, this is something we want to dive in tonight. But we will start now with uh, um, with, with Commissioner Bahil and uh, the position of the European Commission on the Western Balkans and uh, on uh, the uh, enlargement prospects uh, of this region. Please, the video now. Dear participants, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Let me be clear, the future of the Western Balkans is the European Union. There is no doubt about that. The political and economic logic that underpins the European Union applies equally to the Western Balkans. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated how interconnected we are. This is why Last spring, we immediately provided emergency assistance and 3.3 billion euros of support package to the region. 
We have also been working hard on providing vaccines to our partners. This has proved more challenging than we had all initially hoped, but I'm very pleased to announce that we have secured 651,000 doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines for the region. This is because we care about our partners, about the region, its resilience, and frontline medical workers. These deliveries will come on top of over 200,000 doses provided through the COVAX mechanism, to which the EU is one of the biggest contributors. During this pandemic, the EU treated the Western Balkans as privileged partners. But our goal needs to be more than that. The aim is full EU membership for the region, not only partnership. In the past, we have often been facing challenges on both sides. These have undermined the credibility of our commitments. Reforms have often been slow, leading some EU member states to question the transformative power of the enlargement process. On the other hand, the EU has sometimes failed to respond when partners have delivered on reform commitments. To address the root causes of the challenges, we have revised the enlargement methodology. Our revised methodology aims to strengthen the credibility and predictability of the enlargement process while adding dynamism and political steer. Of course, we keep the fundamentals at the heart of the process. The revised methodology is already reflected in the draft negotiating frameworks for Albania and North Macedonia. Member states have not yet reached an agreement and discussions are continuing in the Council. We are supporting those efforts and I hope that the first intergovernmental conferences can be convinced still this semester. We will also apply the revised methodology to Montenegro and Serbia, which was accepted by both countries. We, in particular, need to accelerate the negotiations with Serbia as they have been moving very slowly over the last year. Of course, the decision on opening clusters remain with the member states, but I would like to chart an ambitious course ahead with the aim of opening all clusters. All this, of course, depends on conditions being met first. For Serbia, and equally for Montenegro, which has already opened all chapters, progress in the area of rule of law will be essential. We need to use the potential of the revised methodology to make sure that the EU integration remains the core priority of both countries. For Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have identified 14 key priorities for its EU path in our 2019 opinion on its EU membership application. As other countries before, Bosnia and Herzegovina will need to amend its constitution to comply with the requirements of EU membership. This year provides a chance for reforms to fulfill the key priorities. The European Union will continue to facilitate and contribute to these discussions together with our partners. In Kosovo, we look forward to working with the new elected institutions, the president, the government, and the new assembly. We hope to see more political predictability and stability in the forthcoming period so that Kosovo can speed up the reform process, including in the rule of law and economic and social development. Let me also recall the importance of visa liberalization. The Commission stands by its assessment that Kosovo has fulfilled all conditions, and I would like to thank the European Parliament for consistently supporting the Commission's proposal. However, as you know, a decision is still pending in the Council. We encourage Kosovo to continue building trust with the EU member states, including through bilateral channels. It is also crucial that both Kosovo and Serbia seize the current window of opportunity to make progress in the EU-facilitated dialogue, which is of key importance for their European aspirations. 
Let me now turn to the economic side. It is essential that we speed up the region's economic convergence with the EU. Positive developments in this field will also facilitate all other reform processes. These are areas where there is no use waiting for membership. In other words, early delivery in these areas could bring earlier preparedness for becoming a member. This is why we launched the Economic Investment Plan for the Western Balkans. Its priorities were identified together with the governments of the region and I would encourage them to make best use of the 28 billion euros of funding. With a mix of grants, guarantees, and preferential loans from international financing institutions, such as the EIB and the EBRD, the EU can offer the best possible conditions for major investments in the Western Balkans. This will help governments to get best value for money for future-proof investments. Investments in transport and energy infrastructure, the green and digital transitions, and private sector development will help the accession process, boost growth potential for local businesses, and improve the lives of citizens. We're also looking at the ways to integrate more and more closely the Western Balkans in the EU's single market. This means that in certain sectors, we would like to see the Western Balkans participate in EU policies even before former accession. Let's be clear about the geopolitical nature of this. This is about speeding up delivery on EU standards and bringing Euro faster to the region. It is about accelerating the export of EU standards, linking future member states closer to the EU single market. Creating common regional market as agreed by the region last year, will have a dual effect. It will help to get rid of obstacles to the inter-regional trade. The market is currently so fragmented that everyone loses out, and this is the trend that needs reversing. This approach is not an alternative to EU membership, but quite the opposite. It will help the region reap the benefits of its geographical location and of its privileged relationship with the EU. As such, this approach is in line with the Commission acting as a geopolitical actor. With our world in a period of transition, marked by major geopolitical and economic power shifts, the EU must become a political and strategic player with one voice and one purpose, its own neighborhood. Thank you very much for your attention. May I invite everybody to, um, to use the chat function for your questions? Well, the future of the Western Balkans is the European Union, said uh, Commissioner Vahil. Uh, Mr. McAllister, may I, may I turn to you? Uh, the EP, the European Parliament, released in March own reports assessing um, the Western Balkans and uh, uh, the prospects um, uh, for, new, uh, for, for, for accession to the European Union uh, over the last two years. Um, so what is your, your take of the developments um, in the region? What is uh, your, your uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Committee's position? What's the European Parliament's position? Mr. McAllister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Kreft, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and warm greetings from my hometown in northern Germany. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel discussion, together with the honorable co-panelists and specialists on the Western Balkans. I look forward to an interesting and hopefully stimulating debate. I want to be brief, but I want to make a few uh, political remarks. Let me start by underlining the importance of a public debate and academic freedom for democratic societies, which in the end rely on a vibrant civil society and they also rely on media freedom. We, and with we I mean universities just as parliaments have an important task of distinguishing facts from fiction in an academic 
but also political discourse laying foundations for decision making. As the Commissioner just mentioned, the relations between the European Union and all six countries of the Western Balkans have long been part of our daily business in the Commission, just as in the European Parliament. I have the honour of chairing the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament since 2017, but in the last term from 2014 to 2019, I was for five years the standing rapporteur on Serbia, so I got an insight in one of the six Western Balkan countries at a very detailed level. The Common Foreign Security Policy, the CFSP of the European Union, established by the Treaty on European Union in 1993, aims to preserve peace, strengthen international security, promote international cooperation, and develop and consolidate democracy, the rule of law, and respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. And all these points are of crucial importance for the ongoing process of now integrating the Western Balkan countries into the European Union, because as Commissioner Vahey just underlined correctly, this is fundamental for the stability and security of the whole European continent. Our ongoing efforts will determine whether the Western Balkans will be a source of stability and growth or that of ethnic tensions, organized crime and mass migration. So I believe we must continue to both insist on but also assist with substantial accession related reforms. They're all components for ensuring peace, stability and freedom in Europe. Now, Ambassador Kreft, the merit-based prospect of full membership of Western Balkan countries is in the European Union's own political, security and economic interests. Furthermore, each enlargement has always been an opportunity for the European Union also to revitalize and reinvent itself. It is an integral part of European integration and remains strategically important for the future of our family of nations. Having said all that, there is one pre-essential condition. There can be no there can be absolutely no shortcuts on common rules and values. The European Union is based on democracy, the rule of law and reconciliation. We must vigorously address any perils to them. They should, should they arise within current EU members or candidate countries. EU membership comes with long-term obligations because any democratic backsliding negates the very essence of our political project. So to conclude, I would plead to prioritize solutions to the non-economic challenges in the Western Balkans, transformation covering the rule of law, including the fight against corruption and organized crime, and creating an environment for free media and civil society Despite significant strides made across the Western Balkans, the lack of comprehensive cross-regional progress in fundamental areas remains very alarming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McAllister. Let me now turn to Mrs. Zagulovic, who has been working in this field for many, many, many years. And uh, as she told me, uh, you have met uh, in, in Belgrade uh, at, least, uh, at least once. Um, Mrs. Dragulovic, I hope, I can't see you uh, currently, but I hope that you, you are there, that you can now take the floor and present us with the position from Belgrade. Thank you very much, dear Professor Kraft. I'm here and uh, I hope that you can uh, hear me and you can see me. Perfect, perfectly. 
great. Your uh, excellencies, uh, fellow students, uh, dear participants, it's really my great honor and pleasure to participate in this panel with you today in these unusual times. The topic of today's discussion, Western Balkans, has always been the subject of controversy. Some historians even say it produces more, much more history that it can handle. The nations who live in the Western Balkans today used to be at war for territories, same as in Europe. However, unlike European countries, they are rarely united for something or striving for the same goal, short-lived Alliances were mostly military ones and as such direct against someone or something. They experimented with different regimes in modern history from monarchies, organic or imported, republics, confederations, federation, national states with different types of government, parliamentary monarchies, extreme or soft communist dictatorships, attempts to establish democratic regimes to the current ones, stabilocracy. The only thing that has never happened on the Balkans is democracy. That is why we cannot talk about progress toward European membership without democracy. At the first sentence of his speech, Commissioner Varhey said, what the EU provided to the Western Balkans in terms of aid, how many vaccines, how many billions of direct aid, what is the amount of the pre-accession funds and the latest investments plan that should support fulfilling the conditions according to the new methodology of accession. This crisis, as well as our experience since the beginning of the economic crisis in 2008, shows that all this, including vaccines, can be obtained from other great or emerging powers. That is not the point. Serbia received vaccines from Russia, China, the EU and, and other producers, as well as loans and assistance. The question that civil society organizations from Serbia are constantly asking and which worries us is, what else does the help from non-EU sources mean? Is it unconditional? What values go along with such help? What kind of counter service? What did we do to deserve it? And is it really in the interest of the citizens? As for, for uh, vaccines, that's all right. This is the wars against virus and any help is more than welcome, of course. However, we need to look at the large Chinese investments in Serbia, for example. These are the biggest polluters which Serbia is not able to force to act in accordance with the laws, domestic and EU laws, and protect our environment. There is no control over spending money. Institutions are weak. The level of corruption and organized crime is much higher than the, in the EU. What does that tell us? It is not a matter of funds if they are not conditioned. You can give billions to the environment, science, innovations, to corrupt autocratic governments and the effect on citizens will be zero. So what do we need and why is it important for the overall development and prosperity of the Western Balkan states to become EU members? That promise was given to all these countries at the Saloniki summit in 2003. Only Croatia and Slovenia are member states now. We really need the transformative power of the EU, assistance and support provided uh, the same way or level as of, uh, uh, for uh, Eastern and Central Europe countries. Sincere political support, economic and financial assistance for development and constant awareness of the criteria I, real, I, I really meet. So I agree with Mr. McAllister about uh, conditioning, about new methodology, and about um, 
fundamentals that are on the first place and without uh, rule of law and democracy as a preconditions, it is not possible to conduct any reform in any fields, chapter or cluster, whatever. Where we are today, Western Balkan countries are in various stages of accession. Serbia and Montenegro are can candidates for membership. Montenegro, uh, as already mentioned, opened all the chapters and closed only two. Serbia opened a little more than half all of all chapters and closed two. With the longest running post-communist dictator at power, with an enormous degree of organized crime and corruption, Montenegro opened its last chapters last year as well. At the same time, Serbia did not open one. That looks, it seems like absurd. Now, the situation in Montenegro is changing for the better and in Serbia for the worse. Last year's Euro European Commission reports show that, uh, as well as monitoring reports of the civil society. The citizens also agree that the assessment of the European Commission and the European Parliament are correct, that the situation is really like that. Northern Macedonia, Macedonia and Albania are candidates for membership, but negotiations are not open, although the European Commission recommended it. However, some of the member states were against it. They are still waiting for the start of negotiation according to the new methodology. The conditions are the same, of course, as they have been before, the rule of law, democracy, and the free market. Now we have clusters instead of chapters. The way how to conduct monitoring and reporting has changed while everything else remained the same. Without the rule of law, separation of powers, free elections, and democracy, we have no ways to implement other reforms in any area. And this is why the EU is so important for us. Bosnia and Herzegovina is also on the way to starting the EU integration process, but, uh, but uh, His uh, Excellency, head of EU delegation in Bosnia and Herzegovina will talk more about it. Kosovo is not recognized by five EU member states and the European Commission is treating it in accordance with UN Resol resolution 1244, still Kosovo, uh, has also signed the Stabilization and Association Agreement and started negotiation on visa liberalization. Enormous help is coming from the EU, but the European Commission reports are getting, are getting worse. From war crimes trials, sending barriers to foreign battlefields, violation of human and minority rights, lack of democracy, weak institutions. The latest election, however, gave some hope. Kosovo is headed by a woman. That's the good news. Maybe things will start when it comes to democratization and the rule of law. Maybe that will be the way to start the negotiation between the government in Pristina and the government in Serbia again. They are at a standstill because the Kosovo government refuses to fulfill the obligations from the previously signed Brussels agreement and enable the creation of the Association of Serbian municipalities. This example shows how the countries of the Western Balkans imagine having a functional state. They are mostly interested in territories. However, the question is not on how much territory do you exercise power, but how and are you, your citizens satisfied with it? Do they have perspective, freedom, or do they constantly, as John Galtung would say, suffer structural violence? That's why their latest research shows that uh, almost 200 citizens emigrate daily from Serbia alone, daily, mostly highly educated. Every seventh citizen of Serbia has left his country. Croatia is no better. It ranks second in the EU with 21.9% uh, of citizens leaving their country. This was shown by the report of the World Bank. In 2018, uh, 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 more than 30,000 uh, workers 
left uh, workers left Western Balkans. Economic migration is further slowing the growth of this region. 55% of the total number of immigrants from Bosnia and Herzegovina are highly educated young people, while from Albania that percent is 40. On the other hand, there is enlargement fatigue in the EU. The late, last enlargement when Croatia joined the EU proved to be premature. And in addition, some EU members, not just the Western Balkans, are seeing a decline in democracy and the rule of law. I read yesterday that the Nordic countries will become the greenest area in the world by 2030 through implementing the green agenda and will uh, further strengthen their cooperation within the EU. Why can they cooperate to fully understand that modern threats know no borders, that cooperation is needed and that this is the only way for us to survive on this, our continent. Why don't we at the Western Balkans understand that on that way? Where are Western Balkan politicians wrong and where is the EU wrong? Why where is why were the wars of the 19 allowed and why are stabilocracy and not democracy now? Who gains from this? It is quite example. The question, it is a, a quite clear that the Western Balkan countries gain from EU membership. Eastern European uh, countries are a good example. The question is, what did the EU gain by keeping us on the sidelines? Does this make the EU lose in the global game of influence? How to overcome that? Those are all questions that I want to suggest for discussion. And in the end, Ursula von der Leyen said we share the same continent, we share the same destiny, true. But we also need to look at what makes us and what keeps us aside. I hope that during the debates on the future of Europe, they, uh, there will be opportunities to hear a voice from Western Balkan too, especially young people, your, your colleagues. That is the only way for the children of the Balkan to become citizens of Europe. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mrs. Dragulovic. Uh, many, many questions uh, to, to pick up, but let me, let me first turn to Ambassador Zattler. Uh, Ambassador Zattler, you have both uh, perspectives, uh, the EU perspective, but you are in Sarajevo and uh, you have served as Austrian ambassador to Tirana. So, um, well, fuse the, the two perspectives together. It's, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. And Topardan uh, Dobravece from uh, Sarajevo. Uh, big thanks also to the Andrzej University for putting us together here, even though uh, it's only online and we are very much looking forward to also having those meetings offline again in Budapest or somewhere else. Um, I'm also very happy that uh, last time I counted it was 105 uh, participants we have here around this virtual table. Um, I'm not sure, Ambassador Graft, if this is uh, also an indicator of a new momentum. Uh, but I'm very happy that we have this uh, huge interest uh, on this topic of the Western Balkans. Um, I believe uh, it's important to use the momentum uh, if it is one. Um, it's not always the case that uh, we have uh, that much focus. Of course, in the 90s with the wars, uh, the Bosnia War first, uh, uh, 92, 95, uh, then the Kosovo uh, in, in 99, and then we, we had the strong focus still going into the first years of the new uh, millennium, but at some point uh, uh, it, uh, it faded a bit because uh, also, you know, the journalists uh, moved on uh, and, uh, and there was less uh, interest in this region. I also sense a more interest again. I, I sense there is more focus uh, on this region also because others are becoming more. I think this is definitely one of the reasons we see the so-called third actors here are becoming more active. So I have, uh, I mean, just to give you one example, the last five weeks I had uh, four foreign ministers from European Union countries, I had uh, two presidents from 
uh, European Union countries visiting Sarajevo. And Sarajevo is, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina is probably the most complex country of the whole region. Very complicated, very difficult. You need to spend time to understand, first of all, what's going on and what's the background to the many, many conflicts here in this country. And I take this as a, as a good sign. Uh, also, we see more uh, interest uh, from the new uh, US administration. And this is not unimportant, although far away, but especially for, I would say, two, three countries in this region, uh, it's essential to have a positive US uh, uh, role and engagement uh, in this region. They are Kosovo, of course, because of the history, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, because of also of divorce, uh, and let me also say Albania, where I've been posted before, uh, where there's a huge, where there's quite a big role for the United States to play. Uh, and I believe we have to use that increased focus uh, in the interest uh, of uh, this region and the countries in the region. Um, the purpose, uh, the purpose uh, of the membership criteria uh, is, uh, is, is twofold. On the one hand, they ensure the countries joining the EU are ready to take on and effectively implement the membership uh, obligations. On the other hand, they safeguard the EU as a community governed based on democratic principles, rule of law, and human rights. Uh, and by the way, this is not a given. Uh, and this doesn't stop, even if, when you become a member. I think it's very, very important to always have that in mind that we keep working on the rule of law, uh, on media freedom, even, even once, we are, once we are members. Uh, let me just give you now a few insights, and I'm going to talk mainly about Bosnia-Herzegovina because this country I'm in charge of. Um, if there are questions, of course, I'm also happy uh, then also to speak a little bit al about Albania. But on, on Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, just to tell you where we stand at the moment. PIH, uh, as it's called, uh, um, was a latecomer when it comes to uh, European integration. Only in 2016, uh, it applied for membership. Uh, in 2019, we had the answer from the European Commission uh, in its so-called opinion. Uh, and uh, here, uh, the, the main uh, to-do list, if you want, for the country are the so-called 14 uh, key priorities. They relate to uh, uh, democracy, functioning of democracy, rule of law, and the upholding of fundamental uh, human rights, uh, or, and provide a clear roadmap. And by the way, this roadmap is non-negotiable. I get here uh, from time to time uh, politicians telling me, look, I, I don't like uh, key priority number seven. Uh, this is too much for us. Um, um, uh, uh, for instance, the suspension clause. I don't know if you're uh, aware of that, but this is a clause which every member, every country becoming a member of the union had to swallow that. It means basically if a lower level of government uh, in the country is not able to live up to the obligations under the treaties, the higher level takes up the, the responsibility for that. Now for a country like PIH, which is very decentralized, um, uh, for the Republika Srpska, for instance, they see this as a no-go, that, uh, that uh, at some point it might be the state taking over competences from, uh, from uh, the entity of the Republika Srpska. But this is a non-negotiable roadmap. It's what the 27 countries uh, agreed on, uh, what needs to be done for Bosnia and Herzegovina to, to go to the next step. And the next step for, for BIH is the candidate uh, status. Now, what are the, um, the main issues here on the ground? Um, there are serious issues undermining uh, the functionality of governance. And this is a bit different from other countries in the region because of the complexity uh, of, uh, of government. We have here 14 governments. Uh, we have more than 150 ministers. Uh, we, have, uh, we have quite a bloated uh, uh, public sector. Um, and this makes it quite cumbersome in terms of uh, decision making. Uh, there are a whole uh, host of uh, uh, blocking mechanisms. There are blocking me me mechanisms uh, uh, as far as the entities are concerned in, in the parliament. There are blocking mechanisms uh, as far as the so-called vital national interest is concerned. If one uh, of the three major ethnic groups uh, uh, finds that their uh, national interest uh, is endangered, they can uh, put uh, their foot on the brake. Uh, and this brings uh, then the process to a halt. Uh, and this leads to the fact that many, many laws, uh, uh, which uh, would be important for the country to move forward, are blocked for different reasons. Uh, and this is also one of the reasons why uh, the progress is, uh, is so slow uh, in, in this country. Um, having said that, uh, we've managed last year to, to make progress uh, on a few issues. I'm very happy, first of all, that uh, it was possible 
uh, that uh, we found a solution to the Moster elections. You might have heard about that. Moster was the only city, I think, in the whole of Europe which didn't have local elections for 12 years. Uh, there was a major breakdown uh, in, the, in the negotiations. And uh, at some point, they simply, simply stopped uh, the election process. Um, Moster still uh, carries a heavy burden from the war. Uh, it's basically a 50-50 divided city between Bosniaks uh, and Bosnian Croats. Uh, and therefore, uh, it was uh, very important to get the deal done last year, which allowed the parliament to change the election law and which allowed uh, elections to go forward for the first time uh, after 12 years. This, uh, by the way, when I, when I got involved in this, I was told by many people, don't even touch it. Uh, it's too complicated. It's impossible. Um, uh, spend your energy on something else. Uh, but this tells me that uh, problems even here in BIH are solvable. Yes, they are not easy, they are protracted, but, but even the difficult issues which are on the table uh, this year, and this year is a, is, is a good year to do that because it's a non-election year, uh, and it involves, as the commissioner said in the beginning, it involves constitutional change. But, but even that, I believe, with goodwill uh, uh, is possible uh, to solve. The other thing which we're, we were able to do uh, last year is to get uh, a new uh, strategy for uh, uh, dealing with uh, war crimes, the national war crime strategy that has been blocked for three years. Uh, there are still a few hundred war crimes uh, uh, processes still need to be done. Uh, and this is very, very important in terms of reconciliation. This chapter needs to be closed. Uh, and that's why uh, I put a lot of focus also in my work on getting that done and getting the agreement on the revised, revised national war crime strategy. And last point I wanted to mention here, uh, also because we have uh, uh, Mr. McAllister with us here, uh, the Stabilization Association Parliamentary Committee. This is the committee which every accession country has with the European Parliament. Uh, this had been blocked for five years uh, for different reasons. Um, and uh, this we were able to unblock uh, not easy, uh, uh, but in the end, also with the help uh, of Brussels and the European Parliament, uh, we were able to unblock it and, and we're going to have the first meeting now of this group uh, next month. So um, this gives me hope for 21. The Commission had mentioned before uh, that, uh, that this is a non-election year. It is uh, uh, an opportunity. Uh, it is also, when we look at the last 25 years after the war, uh, these opportunities do not come every year. They do not come. Uh, there were attempts to solve, for instance, the European Court of Human Rights judgments, um, uh, which would allow every citizen to run for the highest office, Sedic Finci. Some of you might have heard. Uh, 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 this has become a symbol uh, for uh, BIH not implementing and not living up to the basic human rights, human and democratic rights. Uh, this is on the table this year that uh, finally not only uh, members of the three ethnic groups, as it's now spelled out in the constitution, not only Bosniaks, uh, Bosnian Croats and Bosnian Serbs can run for the highest office, but every citizen of this country. So this is very high uh, on my agenda. Uh, also, what needs to happen is we need to work on the functionality. What I mentioned before, this is a big stumbling block for the country uh, in moving forward. Basically, the European Union accession process is the massive transfer of legislation uh, from the European Union to the uh, aspiring EU country. And with the current process and the blocking possibilities uh, in the parliament, uh, uh, but also in the presidency, uh, this is uh, 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 way too slow. Uh, so there is also a, a focus this year for us uh, to improve the functionality uh, of, uh, of the country. Of course, uh, one other issue I'm, I'm heavily engaged here, uh, and it was mentioned uh, by uh, the speakers before me, rule of law, there cannot be any discounts on the rule of law. Um, this is the alpha and the omega of the accession process. Uh, and I keep telling my counterparts here on the ground, unless you make uh, a progress on that front, uh, uh, there will not be uh, the next step, which is kind of status for this country. Uh, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, it's cumbersome, uh, especially when the system is as bad or has deteriorated to such an extent as we can see it now, for instance, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, it's very difficult, you know, to, to get it back on track. But uh, uh, it's possible. Uh, I've seen from my previous experience when I was in Tirana, 
Um, uh, and this is one of the most positive aspects uh, I see on rule of law in the whole region, um, that it's possible to turn the corner. corner. Um, in Albania, what we were able to do with this vetting process, which also has its shortcomings, and it led to a bit of a blocking uh, and a blockade in the, in the justice sector. We had for some time, uh, I think more than a year, uh, a non-functioning constitutional court in the Supreme Court, which didn't have enough members because many uh, 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 judges and prosecutors in the process, in the vetting process, uh, got kicked out of the system. Uh, now, four years later, we see less than uh, less than 40% uh, survive this vetting, uh, which is by the way run by, by the authorities uh, in Albania, but with, a, with an oversight from the European Union. And this, I think, could be also the blueprint for other countries. Uh, not easy. Uh, I know it's been tried also in other countries. Um, in Albania, it helped that there was a huge consensus uh, in society, 90% strongly in favor of uh, reforming that sector because everybody had a negative experience with, with the judiciary. So that helped a lot. That, in the end, uh, then also put a lot of pressures on the lawmakers. And we had, uh, I remember that they very vividly, we had a 100% uh, vote in parliament to allow this uh, vetting and this judicial reform to go forward. Uh, so uh, this is something which we don't have in Bosnia and Herzegovina, for instance. This is something also uh, which you find probably don't find in other countries. In Albania, it was possible. And I'm uh, encouraged that uh, we can move uh, on, on a difficult sector uh, as, uh, as is the rule of law. Um, coming to a close, I believe this year, uh, 21, could be a, a good year for the, re for the region. Uh, BIH, I mentioned, um, uh, it was also mentioned before by Ms. Dragojlovic, um, Albania, North Macedonia, very important that we make this next step, that we open the negotiations. We know there is a bilateral angle, angle to it now between Bulgaria and North Macedonia. Unfortunately, there is this temptation, uh, you know, by when we have an asymmetric relationship, one neighbor already in the European Union, the, the other one trying to join that this is abused, used and abused. Uh, uh, we have seen it in the past. We unfortunately see it also now. Uh, I believe it's very, very important uh, to overcome that blockade and uh, start the negotiations uh, with, uh, with the two countries. North Macedonia uh, made a huge step forward. They changed even their name. Uh, and Albania, as I said, um, started from the least, from the worst position uh, as the poorest country uh, in Europe uh, and, uh, and making this transition, and especially with the justice reform, I think both countries have to serve now the next step, which is the opening uh, of negotiations. Uh, of course, Serbia Kosovo uh, is uh, very high on the agenda of the European Union. We have a special envoy, uh, Mr. Lajak, who is in charge of that. Uh, and, uh, and we have now two governments, uh, which, uh, which are, which, uh, which uh, you know, the Kosovo one just, just elected, on the Serbian one, uh, there is no question. So there would be now really the time, I hope, uh, uh, use this next year until the Serbian elections in 22 to make progress on that uh, very important file. I think um, uh, our focus uh, from the European Union side is clear. Um, I'm very also happy that we have this transatlantic uh, stronger relationship now, and this is actually quite good ingredients to make headway uh, in the year 21. Thank you very much, Ambassador Zattler. And uh, you, you mentioned it, uh, it's an important year, uh, 2021. In the meantime, uh, Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Bitterly joined us. He had some connection problems. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to the panel. Um, next year, Ambassador Bitterly, we have elections in France. You are sitting in Paris. France uh, was uh, one of those uh, yeah, leading enlargement skeptics. What's the mood? What's the position in Paris, in France? It's not France alone, but of course, France is the heavyweight. Uh, dear uh, Kraft, beg your pardon for this delayed entry into the conference. Uh, what's, what's the mind here in, in France? The mind remains skeptical towards enlargement. And I was witnessing in a meeting of a French Senate last year and uh, looking at, let's say, the general French reaction, it's, let's say, it's reluctant, extremely reluctant. 
even if they feel and they have a special relationship always from the past towards Serbia, but towards no one else. And, and I feel a bit encouraged what Johannes Sattler has been telling us. Uh, interesting, let's call it this differentiated approach. But my question is till today, did we learn really in the sense of lessons learned from the enlargement, from what I call the great enlargement towards the East? The Balkans is the most complicated area we have, and they need clearly a perspective. The French know this, they see this. But by the way, they have one tremendous problem in front of them. It's they need for any enlargement in future, a referendum. And you know, people answer in a referendum in general, not the question which is put, but a different one. And therefore, let's say enlargement is for the French a highly sensitive, extremely critical subject. And I think they are reflecting still how they should run it in the best possible way. And uh, I've one impression is, and uh, it's clear they know this area needs a clear pers a European perspective of integration. And I still have in mind what one of the parliamentarians from Albania told us in this conference or told me afterwards, please give us a clear perspective, even if it's not enlargement to entry tomorrow, but we need this perspective. Otherwise, the elder people will remain alone and the younger people will emigrate somewhere to any country, somewhere in Europe. Please help us in this way, help us and give us time to develop our societies. Second remark, and this is uh, uh, one feeling I observe often the discussions with French parliamentarians, especially, is uh, there is this word, please, we would like to become a member of the European Union, but we would not like to become re-educated in Europe. We would like to have a chance to develop, but not a re-education. And therefore, uh, I've been uh, arguing since the beginning in favor of a really differentiated approach with more, in the beginning, soft subjects than hard subjects. Legislation at the end, but before, let's help these countries to develop what I call politi a political society, political parties, uh, the rule of law step by step, please, we have even differences between France and Germany about the real content of the rule of law. Uh, human rights, without any doubt, it's clear. But we have to, do, to uh, reinforce all what I call the soft subjects. At the same time, to look after concrete possible steps, specialized steps, in order to help to uh, support uh, these countries in their weak points, in their weak areas, and go there, let's say, with only, without a clear goal to tell them, please, you will be a member at that day or that year. No, I don't think it's possible. Uh, we should have patience, much more patience with them. And let's call it, and uh, Johannes Sattler will pardon this, uh, less technocratical. The last reports of the Commission for me awful to, lear, to, le to read, awful. Much more technoc technocracy and much more terms than content. And therefore, uh, what I would like to see is a real approach, case by case, country by country, and step by step, looking after uh, them, helping them, supporting them. It will be economical, yes. And I think an access to internal market will help them as earlier as, as possible. An access to, uh, to our assistance, for example, from European Parliament, from the, from the parties in European Parliament. And I it will close by a short remark. I had a long debate in the middle of the 90s in Germany with uh, the top people of 
the Social Democratic Party and of uh, the Christian Democratic Party, please reinforce the work of your foundations in these countries much more. And I don't think, especially towards the Balkans, that we have done enough. It's my conviction. Thank you very much, Ambassador Vitterlich. It's already seven o'clock. I would still opt for a second round now to give everybody on the panel to, um, to address uh, some of the questions. So many questions have been, have been raised. Um, um, Mr. McAllister, said um, there's no shortcut without uh, rules and values. Um, there's no discount on, uh, on rules and values, uh, the words of, uh, of Ambassador Zatla. And um, still, there is talk uh, in some um, corners, um, and not only there, that uh, we should take a geopolitical turn on EU enlargement. Um, Look what uh, what China is doing in the Western Balkans. Look what Russia is doing in the um, in the in the Western Balkans. So um, should we not be more forthcoming, Mr. McAllister? Would you would you add this question to the all the other questions? So now I am. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Kreft. Uh, just listening to all the very wise words of the panelists, uh, it came to my mind that we are in a bit of a dilemma. On the one hand, since 2003, since the famous summit in Saloniki, all six Western Balkan countries have a clear enlargement EU integration perspective. And on the other hand, we are witnessing, as Ambassador Bitterlich described the situation in France, for instance, how enlargement policy of the European Union has lost some of its shine and is perhaps still losing its shine. And this I found very regrettable because I strongly believe that the European integration process will not be complete until we have all six Western Balkan countries on board. However, it will in the end depend mainly on the progress they are ready to make for themselves. Having dealt with the Balkans now since 2014, I observe three major internal and external obstacles eroding the enlargement process. The first one is there is a lack of rule of law and democratic mm -hmm. consolidation and also reconciliation in most of the countries. That is a fact. Secondly, there are delays in fulfilling promises made by the EU member states due to their internal dynamics. Many panelists already mentioned, for example, the issue of visa-free travel for Kosovars. This was promised. This was promised for a long, long time and EU member states or some EU member states are not delivering. That is unfair towards the Kosovars. Or well, the other example is the blockade of the accession negotiations, the beginning of the accession negotiations with uh, Nova Macedonia, thanks to the position of one EU member state. And thirdly, what also um, Mr. Bitterly just mentioned in his, of course, diplomatic terms, I also witness sometimes that the EU integration process on the ground in these countries is reduced to an technocratic elite driven process which sometimes seems to have rather little to do with either the joint values or at least the daily lives of ordinary people. Um, I always say that when we EU representatives go to the Western Balkan countries we always spend our time only in the capital. 
I wish we could spend some time outside the capitals of these six countries to just get to know other people. Uh, but instead, we spend a lot of time talking to representatives of civil society who are obviously also used to, dis to welcoming international and European guests every day. Uh, I wanted to make this uh, with a slight a twinking of my eye. But going back to your question, I see these three obstacles and mixed with the inability of us to communicate more forcefully and smartly the benefits of EU integration and enlargement and further undermined by disinformation and malign interference from other countries, from third players like Russia or China, the credibility of the European Union is weakened. So what can we do? And this is where we and the European Parliament are very clear. We need to deliver where we promised. We should acknowledge the substantial progress made by, Northern, by North Macedonia and Albania, and we should open these accession negotiations now. And secondly, we should implement the long overdue visa liberalization with Kosovo. And then we have to be firm on our principles, the rule of law, democratic reforms, media freedom and opposition rights. And a final point, which hasn't been mentioned tonight yet, but I have to underline this as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. I insist that alignment with the European Union's foreign policy must be treated not as a mere footnote, but as a guiding principle in the European Union's footbook and rule book. Okay, thank you very much. Mrs. Dragilovic, uh, from Serbia, from Belgrade. Uh, well, um, let's back to... What's your position? Yeah. yeah, as a civil society, of course, uh, from our point of view, uh, we, we speak uh, frankly and direct. I'm not diplomat, my colleagues also, so we can be more creative, more direct, you know, and to address a real Problem, uh, problems of uh, citizens uh, all around the region, on the ground, in their everyday life. It is not easy, but it is possible to, to connect uh, EU conditions or preconditions with their quality of life, with their own everyday interests, you know. Every single year, when uh, it comes to the European Commission report, uh, always it happened in autumn, uh, uh, October, for example, uh, starts the same debate in Serbia. Why uh, European Union uh, is so, so strict? Why only conditions? Uh, where are the, the benefits, you know? and. I'm a coordinator of the largest civil society platform in Serbia dealing with the negotiation process. We are part of the regular government and parliament procedures in adopting of negotiation positions. And we really have deep insight in what happened on paper, you know, formally, but in real life also. And in 90-90%, our monitoring reports show that the same results as the European Commission and European Parliament reports. Our citizens uh, very well understand that they also wish to live in, in a country with a strict uh, division of power, with independent uh, judiciary, with a country uh, which um, uh, fight against organized crime or corruption, you know. We have the same demands as the European Union officials, you know, both on political and technical level. This is not um, 
this is not problem. I, I, I must agree with uh, Mr. Uh, McAllister. Uh, he uh, is very familiar with the situation on the Western Balkans uh, and with the integration process, both on technical and, and political level. This, that's the true, that, that's the technical process, you know, uh, technically demanding uh, with the not understandable terms, uh, European Union language, you know, so uh, it seems like it is reserved only for experts, you know, and the government officials dealing with the European integration uh, 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 topics, you know. So uh, we conduct many campaigns and uh, really try to explain to our citizens all benefits, not only from um, uh, if ever full membership, but also from the accession process. But the situation in Serbia now, I will share with you the, the results of public uh, pool research. Rising Euroscepticism is present in Serbia due to the fact that the EU accession process is taking too long and it is difficult for citizens to recognize EU's impact in Serbia in this phase of negotiation. Public opinion polls talk in favor of serious skepticism when it comes to the intentions of the EU uh, uh, and the nature of its relations with Serbia. One third of citizens in Serbia has favorable opinion about European Union, whereas somewhat more than one third citizens express the opposite attitude. Additionally, slightly more than one fourth of citizens has neutral opinion about you. It is extremely important to, to, to uh, emphasize the new methodology approach that seeks a clear political will, not controversial uh, statements for, from uh, high officials uh, coming every day to our citizens. Today, the EU is our saver, uh, biggest trade partner, our future is in the European Union uh, on, on declarative level, it's clear that our government is pro-European, not this current government, but all governments since 2000 until now. But uh, tomorrow, the European Union is unfair. They don't want us uh, pro-government uh, tabloids um, provide completely contra, contrary argumentation against the EU and our citizens are confused. From the European Union also cold warm approach. There are clear, clear rules but assessments are soft, you know, we are stricter than uh, EU officials as a civil society in, in Serbia. And I don't know how to solve and how to harmonize with, uh, with the polit politicians and official statements, both on national and EU level. Thank you very much. Let me bring in here now the first question from uh, Andras Pinter. He asks, does the European Union uh, have in case if some of the other actors, he's referring to Russia, Turkey and China, um, steps up more aggressively in the region uh, as Russia did in 2014 against Ukraine. If the countries of the Western Balkans will get closer and closer to EU accession. Does the EU have such a plan by holding onto these countries, whatever happens? Who wants to take this question? Mr. McAllister. Well, um, indeed, the Western Balkans have always been geopolitical and many of our speakers tonight have underlined how crucially important the whole region is not only for that part of Europe but for our whole continent. 
But geopolitics have returned to the Western Balkans even more in recent years. We are seeing activities, not only the well-known actors like Russia, we also are seeing increased economic activity of the Chinese. We have the Turks very active in some of the Western Balkan countries, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina or Kosovo, uh, just to name two. But we also now have increasing Arab influence, uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, uh, who are also starting to get involved. So we must be aware that if we make space as a European Union, others will be immediately there to fill this space. What we have to tell the people in the Western Balkans, we are by far, by far the most important economic partner of all six countries. And we are also by far the biggest donor and supporter for these countries. Where we're not so good at is communicating what we are doing for the six uh, Western Balkan countries. Sometimes, to quote another colleague from the European Parliament, it's amazing the European Union and the member states, they can invest a quarter million, a half a million, a million, two million euros for an infrastructure project, whatever, in the Western Balkans. I and mean, it seems as if the last 50 euros for a poster, for a plaque that tells us or the citizens who actually paid this, not Mr. Putin, but the European Union, these last 50 years have been unfortunately not spent. I know that things have improved. I remember a meeting with the EU ambassadors in the Western Balkans, where we jointly agreed with the European External Action Service and with the then Enlargement Commissioner Johannes Hahn that we need to do more. And it's fair to say that our EU delegations are doing much more. What I would like to see is more engagement outside the capitals. I know it's much nicer, and in these times of pandemic, of course, it's even more challenging, but we need to leave the bubble of the capitals where you usually will have a more international, pro-Western, European, oriented community and we need to go out in the countryside where many people are much more vulnerable to fake news and uh, maligned uh, media. So that is the one point uh, I would really like to make. We need to communicate better and the second point is let's not be naive. Other people are there and one point I really would like to mention finally, I very much welcome that together with our American partners, we have increased our media activities in the region. The one thing is to complain about Russian propaganda and fake news. The other thing is that we need to present quality news on the other hand, and that's why that the Voice of America, Deutsche Welle, BBC, the French, that we have become more active, I think that is very helpful. Thank you. Now I have a question directly to um, uh, Ambassador Sattler from Timothy van Landskron. How does the European Union justify not allowing the Republika, the Republika Srpska to hold a referendum on independence on the one hand and accepting Kosovo sovereignty on the other? That's the one million euro question. Um, uh, before that, um, let me just uh, echo what, what uh, Mr. McAllister said on communications um, and also uh, Ambassador Bitterlich on the um, uh, technocratic character uh, of our, our reporting of, of our work. Uh, on this one, yes, I mean, we, we have an issue there. Um, we have realized that issue. Um, and I think we got a little better. You should read the last one. The last, uh, they're not called anymore progress reports, but country reports. Um, I was actually getting a lot of questions why we were so brutal this time, uh, because it's quite brutal. It's outspoken. It uh, puts things uh, quite squarely uh, where they are. For instance, talking about uh, state capture uh, here in BIH, but also in other countries in the region, talking about the 
uh, abysmal situation when it comes to media freedom in some of the countries here. So um, um, I, I think we got a bit better, but, but of course this is an issue. Uh, but let me also say that the accession process as such is technocratic. Um, the um, negotiations of the chapters, the different laws. Uh, let me give you one example. Um, I had uh, enormous difficulties in my team to explain why do we need in Bosnia and Herzegovina a proper public procurement law. Very, very technical, very boring. Uh, well, we had a huge scandal last year uh, in connection with the uh, purchase of respirators where some people made huge money in this worst crisis ever people would make huge money on these respirators. Why? Because there was no proper public procurement law. Now, this helped me big time because suddenly I had an example, everybody understood why it's important to have a European uh, standard uh, public procurement law. Now uh, I'm, it's in parliament, it's gonna be passed probably in the, next, in the next two months or so. But in general, of course, uh, it, uh, uh, it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult and, and sometimes also very boring process, which we need to get better uh, to, to explain one other example on communications, I've been battling here the first half year when I came um, uh, uh, because we didn't speak, we do good, but we don't speak about it. Uh, so we, uh, the uh, so-called corridor 5C, this goes from Budapest uh, down to the Adriatic coast, 300 kilometers in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, basically 100% financed by the European Union. 80% uh, loans, EIB, EBRD, 20% grants. There was not one poster uh, telling the people that this is actually European Union taxpayers' money. Now they are posters, but it's a huge, you know, uh, process also in getting that through uh, into the heads of your own people. That you know, all the operations people that they need to think communications at the same time. Very difficult uh, process and work in in, in process. Uh, on the on the question uh, post. I think this is comparing apples and pears, um, uh, what we had in, in Kosovo. And I think this is well established from the end of the 80s, um, the uh, policy uh, of Milosevic, basically apartheid. I was posted there in 97. I saw it uh, firsthand, what that meant for the, for the people there being, being deprived of basic human rights, uh, massive human rights violations, expulsions, war, education was, uh, education system was, uh, it was not possible to, to, to teach even in the, in the local language. Uh, then we had the war, then we had the status process, which uh, went on for five, six years until in 20, uh, when was it, 2008, uh, the, 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 uh, the independence uh, was proclaimed by Kosovo. Um, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Republika Srpska, there's nothing of the sort, there's no violation of human rights. Uh, yes, you might say there is the, the, there are the two principles uh, in, uh, uh, in international law, the right of self-determination, de 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 and on the other hand, the inviolability of, of borders. These are, two, the, these are two principles in international law. Uh, but uh, I think we have to be very careful in further atomization of, uh, of this uh, region. The countries are already very small. And the other aspect, of course, is that uh, the... Um, and this is now a hot topic again, uh, unfortunately, after the, 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 some non-papers non going around, uh, uh, they're, they're very unlikely that there will be a something, a peaceful dissolution of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, exactly, you know, this kind of uh, nationalist policies, uh, which led to the, war, to the war in the first place in the 90s, uh, this is a recipe for uh, disaster. Uh, the um, federation of this country, federation is a second entity consisting mostly of, of Bosniaks and Bosnian Croats, uh, will not sit still uh, with, with, uh, with a unilateral secession. Also because, and this is the other point, uh, it's not, you know, this is not uh, a need, you cannot separate neatly, you know, the, the different territories according to ethnic criteria. Uh, it's intermixed. Uh, yes, there is less uh, after the after the war. There were expulsions uh, and people people uh, had to leave. But still, it's still a very mixed country, uh, and therefore, uh, I think these two uh, uh, questions are simply not comparable. Thank you. I have two questions on demographics, on migration, on. Uh, uh, from um, Jelena Ilic and from Timothy uh, von, von Landskron. Um, um, 
visa liberalization is, could lead to even more uh, brain drain, to even more people uh, leaving uh, the region. Um, um, what could the, US, uh, the European Union do to, uh, well, to, 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 to stop this or to, to, um, uh, to, to, to put the brakes on this? Um, uh, would, uh, would it not be uh, a good idea to, um, to, improve, uh, to, to improve their credibility uh, uh, um, particularly uh, uh, a credibility accession process. That's that's the uh, exact question. Yeah, Mr. McAllister. I can be very brief. If you look up the numbers of young Kosovars who have already left their home country, mainly to Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, you can use the counter argument. I mean, so many have left without visa liberalization, that isn't really a hurdle. My issue is, is something different. Mm. The European Union was very tough on Kosovo and formulated lots of conditions that need to be met. The Kosovars delivered every single commitment. And then the European Union, or to be precise, some member states say, no, it's still not enough. If you do that, no wonder if you start losing credibility. It's like in sports, you cannot change the rules of the game while the game is ongoing, or at least you can do that. But afterwards, those who are on the field and those who are watching the match will be slightly upset. That's one of the, look, Kosovo, visa liberalization for Kosovars isn't the most attractive sell in my home country, Germany. You can imagine that there are issues which my voters might find even more attractive, to put it in very diplomatic terms. And still I'm saying this as a German Christian Democrat, you don't do this. The Kosovars delivered, and by the way, it's the same with the North Macedonians. The North Macedonians delivered something which is probably the, the most you can ask a country for, to change the name. They changed their name. And afterwards, they are still blocked in the negotiating process. One of the most interesting visits for me was when I had a discussion with young students in Skopje, organized by the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, where these young students told me, oh, Mr. McAllister, you have people like you. You people from Brussels have been telling us for 20 years that North Macedonia is on track. What have you actually done apart from finding warm words? That's why I'm so upset. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Dragulovic wants to yes. respond immediately to it. Yes, I, I, I wish uh, to share with you the information coming from uh, main actors, high officials from North Macedonia and Greece. Prime Minister actually, they stated that they are conduct that so important and so historical agreement in a five minute on parking, you know. So there is no anything so important and so historical in the changing of name. And that's the not point. The point is the rule of law, in, uh, uh, institutional ability to protect their own citizens, environment, and to provide them a uh, uh, democratic way of life, you know. So when it comes uh, to, to, to uh, migration, uh, policy and uh, um, the young generation striving for living in uh, uh, green countries to, to breathe clean air, to, uh, to work or to educate it by clear, clear uh, rules and not to live in the capture state, they will definitely become equal citizens in the EU who share the same values as they already do, all uh, the, the, the new generations. They do not remember Tito, Milosevic, Tujman, or Enver Hoxha. They feel the consequences of such way of ruling country. If they do not become citizens of the EU member states, they will become refugees like in the 90s and that scenario is unfortunately never ruled out. Some suggestions and support for the redefining the borders 
came from the former communist politician and today prime minister of Slovenia, member state of the European Union. Such people never give up. And there are some in the, in the EU and abroad. My generation has been fighting against such people and such regimes for more than a half century, for democracy, not stabilocracy, for a prosperous and green you know, European Union, but here on the Western Balkans. In contrary, all our children will become members, uh, uh, citizens uh, of the European Union, but by migration processes, not by democratization of this part of our common continent. Thank you very much. We are running out of time. I'm taking one last question, then I give you I give everybody the opportunity for a last short uh, statement. So the last question comes from Jakub Wojcik. Yesterday, Poland's ombudsman asked citation, where are the EU institutions when we need them to defend the rule of law? A judge prosecuted by the illegal disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court edit uh, citation, if the EU is of law in one member state, it probably can't defend the rule of law at all. In this context, my question is, how can the EU demand improving rule of law standards from the candidate countries if it can't even defend the rule of law in its own member states? Well, difficult question, I admit. Who wants to take it? Mr. Bitterlich, Ambassador Bitterlich. I take the whole risk <laughs> because this is one of my favorite debates with some friends in Central and Eastern European countries. It's not a debate, let's say, black and white possible because we have to show to them that we are really supporting the rule of law, first of all, in our countries and then support them in order to develop the same idea. We have always to bear in mind, where do they come from, please? They do not have the same experience as others have had in the past. And therefore, for example, for me, one of the best job we have done in the 90s was the support to some Eastern European countries on judicial reforms by a German foundation supported by the Ministry of Justice, which has reformed the whole work of justice, for example, in, <clears throat> in the Baltic countries. For, for me, one of the best ideas. But uh, this is important and there, I think our political foundations can do much more uh, than they have done in the past. I see in a critical way the situation in Poland but please, I would not like to extend the debate and uh, repeat what Polish friends are telling me, for example, about the nomination of the judges of the, Euro of the German uh, Constitutional Court, please, or of the German, German Federal Court of Justice, please. We have to be a model for these countries and they have to, let's say, to follow, let's say, to learn step by step. For me, it's three principles which are important. First, it's reliability on our side. David McAllister is owned entirely right on this. Second, visibility. We have to show that we are supporting, helping these countries. I mentioned just this marvelous visibility, this famous, famous auto, motorway in Montenegro built by the Chinese, uh, which put the whole state of Montenegro in a deep trouble. Uh. Now they are trying to change it, and our role is to support the state in this new approach, in this new way. And the third one is, let's say, visible people for pro and projects for people, for people. And visa free is one aspect, but uh, I take always the example of police cooperation, except police and uh, judicial 
uh, institutions of these countries as partners. Help them. L and let's help them to protect their borders much more than we do it today. We have to underline to show what we are doing for them. But these are small examples. I will stop here. Okay, thank you very much. We are in our last round. I start with Ambassador Sattler because he has to he has to leave uh, 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 early. Ambassador Sattler, one to two, maximum two minutes. Thank you. I can be even shorter very, very quickly. Um, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for that uh, interesting exchange and the huge interest at this time uh, also by your students. Um, the EU has the best offer by far on the table for this region. Uh, you just need to look at the numbers. We need to get better at communications, at selling this. Uh, uh, and here, I think there's a lot to be done still on our side. Second point, of course, the EU perspective needs to stay real. Uh, and this, uh, we, we, we must not lose populations uh, in, in the process. You know, if, if uh, the perspective is, uh, is pushed further and further away, people cannot imagine having this and uh, enjoying the freedoms in the European Union in their lifetime or for their children. So this is something I think we have to be aware. Of course, the, the other factor here is the, the fan club of enlargement in the Council of the European Union is not growing. So there is not a huge support. We have to keep that in mind. That's why it's so important to be also uh, creative uh, in, in, in terms, uh, in, in, in the face of, of resistance to enlargement. We have to, uh, and we've made a few steps in that direction in the new enlargement policy. Uh, we have to uh, uh, we have to see at ways in opening up a certain policies policies, but also certain uh, 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 pots uh, of uh, EU budgets. Uh, if a country uh, is able able to join us, if a country is able to fulfill certain standards in a certain sector, I think this this is an, uh, a creative approach which we need to think through and also use for other methods because uh, it's not going to be fast, and therefore I think we have to be very creative. Uh, in, in, in going forward. Thank you. Mrs. Dragolovic, your last one to two minutes. In one minute, I really want to thank you to everybody for this opportunity and for honest uh, uh, in, in this uh, very interesting debate. And I hope it's a beginning, not the end of debate with all um, actors uh, within the region, with the European Union, and the future debate about European future uh, will open space for uh, debate uh, uh, all around Western Balkan countries, how we see how our young generations uh, see the future of their own continent and uh, our union with other European countries. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Ambassador Bitterly, another last word. You, are you have to unmute yourself. Yes. Just coming back. This area is, David McAllister is right, is our last area where we have really to succeed. And where we are not, let's say, not yet on this side of a success story. I don't see it. I see the, the intervention of others. I see the Chinese role. I see the attempts of the Russians. Uh, I see some others. But there, I think we have to do a real effort to be more credible, reliable towards these countries. It's perhaps not accession tomorrow, but they have to see that we are doing for let's say for them and trying to reach a better life. Thank like, you. And the last word deserves the European Parliament. Mr. McAllister. Thank you. I want to stress just one further issue, and that is reconciliation. Reconciliation is the basis upon which the European House has been constructed, and we cannot afford to import any kind of unresolved bilateral conflicts. And that's why it's so important that we finally end disputes with neighbors in the region. This would be beneficial for everyone in Europe. So we need to support all those who are facilitating the conclusion of the talks between Belgrade and Pristina, between Serbia and Kosovo. Uh, we need to and Ambassador Zatla 
being in Sarajevo knows this best. We need to overcome the, inst the institutional paralysis of Bosnia and Herzegovina, moving from Dayton via Brussels uh, to Sarajevo. Greece and Northern Macedonia have demonstrated that with sufficient political will, impossible is nothing, but you need political will. And a final remark, in this regard, while the role of politicians is the most noticeable, it is young people, academics, journalists, civil society and regional organizations that advance to overcome the legacies of the past and they need to be supported in breaking barriers and that's why in the end it's about connectivity, hard connectivity but also soft connectivity and that's why I welcome your initiative Ambassador Kev to bring people together that we discuss these issues. Thank you very much, um, no summary from my side but I think we have seen there is some momentum, there is some hope that there will be progress towards EU accession but there can be no doubt, there's hard work, there's a lot of work in order to get there. Thank you very much. Thank my four panelists uh, for this very interesting discussion. Thank you for, for all the participants, for the big audience, for your interest in this region. I think uh, we all have to pay much more attention to the Western Balkans. It's, it's worth it. It's, uh, it's great that, uh, that uh, war is something of the past, and that we look towards a much better future for the Western Balkans, and this means for the entire, uh, for the whole of Europe. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, and bye bye.